cool. We rolling? Rock and roll. Cool. Uh, so we'll start with some intros, just so everyone knows. Um, you know, I'm I'm pretty excited about this one. I think we're gonna have a, a fun time, and we'll see if I can uh, get you guys to embarrass yourselves. But uh, probably not too many embarrassing <laughs> things. Uh, just really, really cool stuff. So uh, yeah, we'll start with you. Um, a little background on yourself. Introduce yourself and uh, sure. go. Yeah, Tom Veltri. I uh, was a RSO backseater in the SR71. RSO is Reconnaissance Systems Officer. In case uh, for people that are familiar with the, with the uh, acronym. Um, Flew the airplane for about five years. Uh, I was at Beale for almost 10 years. I flew the KC-135 first, the Q model that refueled the SR. And then I had an opportunity to move over to the SR, which was fantastic. Uh, have over 600 hours in the, in the aircraft and over 100 uh, operational missions. That's great. Uh, my name is Bob Beeler. I started this uh, whole idea out when I was very young, uh, racing boats. Mm. And I decided at that time there are two things I want to do more than anything else. And uh, it was all about loud noise and speed. And so a few years later, I went to pilot training and uh, became an experimental test pilot and went off and got qualified in the SR-71 and flew it for about five years and uh, got about a million miles at uh, above Mach 3 and about uh, 1,000 hours were in a spacesuit. Awesome. What is the uh, fastest boat you've driven? Uh... My hydro went about 65 miles an hour. And that's, that's, that's on the water. Fast. That's pretty, that's cooking pretty good. Yeah. That's pretty great. Cool. And then we uh, have a new face of Hermius, uh, a recent joiner. Uh, yeah. Yeah. My name is Michelle Turlick. I'm a senior flight test engineer here at Hermius, uh, graduate of the National Test Pilot School and been in flight test for about 15 years. Awesome. Awesome. So yeah, uh, basically all of our listeners are going to know what the SR-71 is, but uh, for those that don't, the very small minority, uh, yeah, who wants to take that one first? Uh, and just kind of give a high-level overview of you know what the plane is and uh, what makes it so special. Uh, plane was built for reconnaissance. Uh, our mission was to go out and basically take pictures and collect uh, signals intelligence. Um, it was the Air Force took uh, the aircraft after the CIA flew it for a couple of years. Well, they flew the uh, A-12, mm -hmm. and then uh, the SR-71 though was taken by the Air Force in uh, 1964. Um, aircraft flew from 1964 till its initial retirement in 1990. Mm -hmm. And then we brought it back for three years, mostly with Bob's help. Yep. <laughs> uh, brought it back for three years and uh, retired it again in 97? Uh, 90, yeah, 95 to 97, that's yeah. correct. Okay, so there are no current, there, there aren't any uh, SR-71s out there flying today, unfortunately. No, so, the, but the uh, aircraft flew over, we could fly um, over 80,000 feet. Mm -hmm. uh, our operation envelope was 80,000 feet Mach 3, mm -hmm. basically. Uh, you could fly for almost an hour at Mach. Mm -hmm. You know, you hear about a lot of aircraft that can go over Mach 2 and this kind of thing. They do it for minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, most fighter aircraft that can do it, they run out of fuel, what, about five minutes, ten not minutes. Good. Not very much. Mm -hmm. We go an hour. That's incredible. So, you know, do the math. You get a long way. and Start sweating a little bit probably toward the end of that hour. <laughs> I'll tell you, when you had the pressure suit on, I mean, I felt like I, felt like I was crawling back into the womb. <laughs> it was so comfortable. Oh, there you go. When you sat in the cockpit... And you had the press suit on, the air's flowing around you. There's no better feeling in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'll add a couple other comments. Uh, you know, the SR today mm -hmm. is still holds the record for the fastest high and fly airplane, pr uh, production airplane ever built. And they set those records almost 50 years ago. It's incredible. It's incredible, but it's also sad. Certainly. That, that this country hasn't been able to develop anything to can match that or exceed that mm -hmm. and that's what we need to continue to do is keep pushing the envelope mm -hmm. so we can break those records why do you think that is um is this political is this financing you know is this technical where or are there not enough people being trained on it where do you see the kind of major issues that lead to this uh kind of decline in speed really that we're seeing in aviation well you know, it's all of the above. Mm -hmm. um, it definitely, it's, uh, it costs a lot of money to build an airplane like this, and there's got to be a main reason to do it. Uh, the SR was built because of the challenges we had from the Soviet Union 
after they shot down a U-2 aircraft, we had to have something that was semi-invincible, mm -hmm. which we did. I mean, uh, if you look at the history of the SR-71, about 4,000 surface-to-air missiles were shot at the SR. How many hit the airplane? Zero. Ah, the old goose egg. <laughs> We've never had an aircraft lost in combat in the SR-71. We've never had a pilot or RSO killed in the SR-71. There's been some engineers that uh, on some test stuff, they had trouble when we were flying a D-21 drone off mm -hmm. the back, right. which is something that probably a lot of the people listening don't know about that uh, system, but it's quite a remarkable. We talk about you know high-speed drones today. Mm -hmm. They were do we were doing it in the SR-71 right. back in the 70s, and mm -hmm. they, where they launch a D-21 drone off the back of the SR, it would go out to Mach 3.5 at 100,000 feet and go a couple thousand miles. It, uh, then the camera would come out and an airplane, a C-130, would pick it up. Throw out some but, magnetic tape and uh, get it intercepted. They had a big catcher in front of the C-130, mm -hmm. just like they did with the satellite uh, imagery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It would come down in a basket and they'd go and catch it. Yep. That's but, a great uh, kind of reference vehicle that we look to a lot um, is the D-21. Uh, it's about the same, roughly the same scale as Quarter Horse. Yeah. Um, obviously, you know, it's air launched, uh, so there's no turbo machinery or anything like that that we're going to have on Quarter Horse. But uh, yeah, we uh, take a lot from the use cases, especially yeah. uh, as an ISR platform. And, you know, now that we can send data back, not as, you know, magnetic tape getting thrown out of the vehicle, uh, it should be a lot more useful, especially as we start to get field these systems. So, right. um, so you know you mentioned uh the soviets so can we talk about like a little bit more about the the time period when this was being developed about uh you know paint a picture for like um what the world looked like like why did we need this so bad um you know i, I think a lot of our listeners are you know relatively long my, young myself included you know uh help help us understand the the context in which the sr was was flying okay well I'll, let me start and tom you can just fill in the, the blanks here but uh the, the world was actually safer back during the Cold War. Ooh, that's a good, that's a spicy take. I don't, and, <laughs> I don't know if and, and that's here's, surprising. And I'll explain why. Sure. We knew who the good guys were, mm. and we knew who the bad guys were. And they were the two team leaders, and everybody kind of went one side or the other. And nobody ever wanted the two big guys to come together and fight, because that would have been, that end the world. Mm-hmm. So as a result, the ones below that didn't get in the fight. Today we're in another world where it's transnational terrorism and uh, other countries that are going out of their own. Look what's going on over, the, over Eastern Europe right now. But back then, we needed to make sure we knew everything we could about the adversary, where the submarines were, where the missiles were, where they were maneuvering, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And the one platform that could do that better than any, because satellites were too predictable, we had an airplane like the SR that was unpredictable mm -hmm. that could go pretty much anywhere they wanted in the world and pretty much uh, be safe and come back and be able to it was we didn't have any weapons aboard but we had data that went sometimes right to the president of the United States so mm -hmm. that that was the importance of having this mission Tom? no I agree uh, it was more than just the Cold War though too okay um, you know, if you think about it uh, during uh, Desert Storm, Desert Shield, the SR-71, uh, Schwarzkopf actually asked for the aircraft. We had just retired it, literally months before. I had just got to the Pentagon, and uh, so I was the SR guy on the joint staff, and um, we briefed it all the way up to Chairman Pyle mm -hmm. that uh, you know General Schwarzkopf wants the airplane. How fast can you bring it back? Just a matter of months. We'd have right. it flying. It could photograph the entire synoptic coverage of a, the entire country of Iraq every day. Mm -hmm. One big picture of Iraq. To me, that's a pretty amazing capability. Right, right. Uh, why would you not want to have that? Mm -hmm. Certainly. So, um, now maybe that doesn't work in, in Iraq or in Afghanistan but it certainly works in a lot of places. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, that's something I think that was pretty interesting uh, when we first started having conversations with DOD uh, and other government customers was that 
uh, you know, initially, you know, you think of speed as survivability, but it's really time to target, time to eyes on something, right? And that's where we're getting a lot more traction, um, especially when we talk about, uh, you know, predictability of satellites and when war games happen, and those are the first things that go out when we're talking about, you know, strategic competition. Um, you know, that's what ended up being more interesting is like, how do you cover, you know, how do you deal with the tyranny of distance more? And that's where we're finding kind of the most interest uh, in what we're doing. Um, Remember, we did this in the pre uh, space where well, space was everything. Mm -hmm. Right. No GPS, right. no navigation, no, no, or no uh, weather capabilities like we have now. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Let me add to your story about bringing the airplane back. Uh, I happened to be uh, got sent to Harvard to school and the, this all happened. The desert storm started. I actually got a call from Senator Glenn's office mm -hmm. that asked exactly the same question. And they wanted me to answer them right there. Can we bring the SR back and so on? So I said, yeah, but write a big check. Mm -hmm. But we did bring it back. It wasn't that big a check either. You know, because we had, we had <laughs> the thing that we had going for us that maybe you need to do too. We had mm -hmm. lots of, of J58 engines sitting around, which was always the long pole in the tent when we mm -hmm. were flying operation. Right. We had all the airplanes we needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, coming from the rocket world, uh, you know, especially with development programs, it's the engine that ends up being the long pull. Um, and so being able to try and decouple that as much from the airframe or having the right redundancy. So, I mean, that's why we have J J85s strewn about uh, just to have some backups and uh, to have some hardware ready to go. You know, I'll tell you about the capability of the, the uh, optical bar camera. Mm -hmm. We just talked about capability to take wide area synoptic coverage. The OBC, the optical bar camera, was just retired from the U2. Mm -hmm. Was it last week? Last week. Last week. Wow. So wow. that that capability right. existed all the way through to last week. Mm -hmm. Now, we could do a lot more area, a lot faster. Mm -hmm. But if you have air superiority, the U-2 does a hell of a job. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And when you have working technology, I mean, the B-52 is another example. It's just, it is a, a platform that's going to be around for a long time just because it's, it's a still working. But yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's, and it's big and, it's, and people know how to use it. Um, so, you know... Michelle, you recently joined us, uh, and you know um, I want to hear you know your first take. It's been you know a few weeks now. Uh, how are we kind of approaching the development process differently? And then I want to kind of relate it back to the kind of risk appetite of uh, the SR seventy one days. Uh, mm -hmm. Kind of segue into there. So yeah, how, how are we doing things differently? Um, what are you excited about um, on the development side and, and our risk posture? Yeah, well, there, there are definitely a couple of parallels between the SR-71 program and how rapidly that was developed and, and all the incremental capabilities that went into developing an aircraft that was so uh, well tailored to its mission, mm -hmm. you know, to the point where some of that technology is still being flown up until last week. <laughs> so <laughs> that in itself is, is uh, really incredible that you, you step back and you look at some of the technical challenges that the team had to face. Mm -hmm first use of titanium in an airframe, determining how to manufacture with titanium, working through all the sensors, technologies, navigation equipment that, that didn't exist prior to the need of the SR-71, and mm -hmm. then packaging all those technologies together and, and use them. So you know, technology development was, was also, uh, for propulsion, was what made that airframe possible. And coming into Hermes and seeing our propulsion development process, seeing our airframe development process, we have a lot of, um, I would say, advantages over the high caliber team that got the SR-71 and its predecessor, the A-12, into the air. But um, the, the challenges of the flight environment are the same. Mm -hmm. We have uh, the advantages of modern computing, the advantages of GPS, you know, compact avionics systems that that uh, weren't present in the SR-71 days. Mm -hmm. But still, the, the need for um, this type of capability and the advantage of having a small, high-caliber team right. set together to solve those problems, package them together, and work on an effective and you know, a platform that's, that's so well-suited to its mission mm -hmm. is really exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you know, we talked about it briefly in the last podcast on the Flight Sciences one, um, but you know, it's about knowing when to... to to use the modern computation and then stop when it's no longer appropriate. And exactly. I think that's, that's you the guys balance, right? still pull out slide rules once in a while. Exactly. Yeah. All slide rules. <laughs> yep. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, punch cards. Yeah. <laughs> let me, let me uh, pile on a little bit. So as I study the SR and Skunk Works, Kelly Johnson and, and everything there, I, I see they had to overcome five major innovations. There were thousands of things because 
as Kelly said, everything had to be invented, but there were five really major ones that had to be squared away first. You know, the first one was physiology. Mm -hmm. How do you keep the crew member alive at those extreme altitudes, temperatures, and speeds to be able to eject at 80,000 feet at Mach 3 <laughs> and survive? Yeah, yeah. incredible. Yeah. Which we could, mm -hmm. and we did. Other crew members wow. have done that. Mm -hmm. So that was one. The second was Yeah, our solution to that is just uh, put them on the ground. <laughs> yeah. At least the first. One yeah. G straight and level. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> then, you know, that's one. So num number two would have been, you know, the whole um, the ramjet to build the right kind of propulsion system. I mean, it hadn't been done before. Right. Mm -hmm. That's where the magic was. Mm -hmm. Ben Rich designed those inlet ramjet and it, and it was just an amazing amount of genius that it took to do that. And that's where that was number two. Number three, of course, the aerodynamics. The aerodynamics on that airplane, just looking at the SR, it's a, it's a double delta wing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was not by accident. You know, I could get into the technology, but, you know, when you go transonic in the SR, that the, uh, the uh, uh, aero, uh, center, aerodynamic center moves aft very quickly, up mm -hmm. to about 45 to 50% mean aerodynamic cores, which causes a lot of loss of dyn uh, direct, uh, dynamic stability. Sure. So that chines went out there that moved it forward. Mm -hmm. And when you got the speed and altitude, they, the CG started moving aft mm -hmm. and the aerodynamic center started moving forward and they met at 25 degrees, or excuse me, 25 degrees mean aerodynamic cord, mm -hmm. which mean there was basically no trim drag mm. that allowed the airplane mm -hmm. to fly that fast. That was, you know, another one of those rem remarkable things. Yeah, that's pretty impressive for tuning when you're using slide rules or designing by right. hand and you're not using the computation. And even if you had the computation, this is something that we face, is, you know, how much can you trust it? How much do you want to right. really bet on, oh, it'll be here at this Mach number, yeah. Uh, and yeah. It, yeah, yeah, you, and it's there's it's not always exactly right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, yeah. the other it's thing yeah. that, that was actually a change <laughs> change that came through in the flight test program. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's like lowering the nose for two, about two degrees to fix the trim drag. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. For number four was uh, material science. Mm -hmm. You know, right. how do you keep that airplane from burning up going that fast? The right. average temperature was over six hundred degrees, and the cockpit was six hundred twenty-two degrees. And we were I was right behind this little window that was six hundred. 20 degrees. So the material science is how do you use titanium? How do you mill it? Uh, and all that had to be done from zero knowledge base. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and windows I, too. Huh? Windows. Mm -hmm. Windows were, Jeez. you know, like three or, or five inches thick. Mm -hmm. And uh, from the sensor standpoint, the lenses on the cameras had to be preheated hours before the flight because of the thermal distortion that would occur mm. as you fly faster in the and then the last thing well, is... talk about the tires real quick, too. The what? Tires. The tires, yeah. The tires was part of the material science thing because there was only six main wheels on touchdown and trying to dissipate 100,000 pounds of, of force uh, inertia going down the runway and stopping was very hard. So these tires were made uh, by Goodyear, mostly rubber, a little bit of, of uh, gaseous nitrogen in there. Mm -hmm. But uh, those were really quite remarkable to be able to withstand those kinds of uh, heat dissipation. Well, originally the tires, they, they used, they didn't use an inert gas. And when I took off, expanded in altitude and blew up. Blew up. No, that'll right. do it. And then the fourth, the, the fifth thing I think was a, an innovation that had to be developed is something that Tom had to use all the time. And that was the astro inertial system. Mm. We didn't have GPS. Mm -hmm. We couldn't use Tac and Lorans and all that. We had to be able to fly anywhere in the world and be able to stay on the black line. We mm -hmm. could not deviate off that black line. That was a rule of flying. And the ANS system was an astro inertial system that looked at three stars simultaneously and updated the INS system. Right. And I mean, I've had missions where I'd fly from California over the top of the pole into the Milden Hall, we look at the INS and it's maybe a couple meters off. That's, mm -hmm. how, that's how good it was. Yeah. It's better than GPS. Better than GPS. Better than GPS. We had corridors in certain areas that were maybe a mile to three miles that, to stay in international airspace and never had any problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's pretty awesome. And, you know, and that's something that, especially as we're looking as this uh, as a defense capability, um, you know, 
GPS jamming is one of the easiest things given how low energy a GPS signal is. So um, that is certainly something we're looking at. Um, you know, there's some partners out there that we're also discussing with because do we need to be experts at uh, star tracking? Uh, maybe not, but um, it's also uh, my background in GNC. It gets me pretty excited is to, uh, you know, not rely on GPS and see what you can do uh, in a PNT denied nav environment. But um, yeah, that's pretty exciting. So in a test program for something like this, you know, what do you think led you down this path to where you ended up, um, you know, ending up being the right choice for, for that? And how does someone, you know, when they're early in their career, start thinking about um, a career in flying fast vehicles or kind of a, you know, very targeted um, pilot uh, environment? Let me address that a little different way. Sure. Um, I have talked to, I don't know how many men in young, young men, boys, girls who have told me the first model they ever built was an SR-71. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, talk about an airplane that just captures the imagination. Mm -hmm. Nothing even comes close. I mean, and this is today. A guy, a guy just came up to me the other day uh, at, uh, at breakfast and uh, found out I flew the SR and he goes, my son, six years old, first model. SR mm -hmm. 71. Yeah. I had a poster. Over, yeah, yeah. You had a poster. <laughs> That's why I became a flight test engineer. Yeah. So yeah. why did we want to fly it? I mean, God, if every, <laughs> I mean, if everybody that built the first model, if they could make their dreams come true, right. they'd be flying SR 71s. Right. Yeah. So it's obviously the speed. Um, I think there's an, a design aesthetic <laughs> appeal too, right? Um, so I guess, how would you, if you had, you know, if you were going back and you were in Kelly Johnson's seat, how much do you turn the knob on design aesthetics? It's something we spend time thinking about because it does matter to some extent. Um, and how much do you degrade performance for well, something that looks really good? Now, yeah, aerodynamics well, look good. I mean, that aircraft was designed for a mission. Sure. Mm -hmm. And you notice there's no right angles on it. Mm -hmm. It's all, all about the stealth technology. Radar bounces off it. Radar observing paint, for one thing. But then the radar bounces off in directions, doesn't come back. Mm -hmm. And uh, that by I, itself kind of makes it look I, good. I think, I think the mission created the airplane. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. And the appeal of the airplane, and, and I think it's something that you have an, an opportunity to do mm -hmm. in, in Hermius. Uh, I got inspired in technology watching the space program, the initial man flight. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be just like those folks. I did too. And, <laughs> it, and that's what I geared my life from a very young boy, skipping school to watch the space flights. I never told my parents about that. But, you know, it's like I, the most wholesome reason. Like that's, <laughs> that's like pretty, it's like you're not smoking pot out bag. Like <laughs> <laughs> that was pre-pot. <laughs> but but uh, I, I wanted to do that and I was inspired to do that. So I, I focused myself to set myself up. I mean, I took the right courses in college. I, I, I did okay in high school, but I accelerated in college. I went to grad school. I went to pilot training. I went to test pilot school. You know, I was focused on being an astronaut. Mm -hmm. And this SR-71 just came, came, came around. I right. said, I want to do that yeah. because mm -hmm. I want to fly in space. Mm -hmm. I don't want to ride in space. Mm -hmm. And when you're flying the SR, you know, at altitudes sometimes way above 80,000 feet, mm -hmm. you are flying the airplane. You're not along for the ride. And I remember when I'd fly missions, I'd always check to see if the space shuttle was up that day. And when it wasn't up, when I got to altitude, I tell my backseater, we are the highest flying people in the world today. Now, you know, it gives me goosebumps just thinking about that. Mm -hmm. You know, the small number of people that were selected to go do that. I mean, our selection process was every bit as hard as being an astronaut. I mean, I right. went to, uh, I was a finalist three times in astronaut uh, uh, selection. And the SR-71 selection process was equally hard to just get in that. You know, you had to be put in into the, to the simulator, had to prove that you had the talent to be able to grasp this technology that fast. Right. And we didn't, treat, we didn't teach people how to fly the airplane. You had to be a, a, a number one pilot from anywhere as you were flying before we'd, we'd even talk to you, mm -hmm. like air refueling. We mm -hmm. didn't teach people how to air refuel it. We assumed they knew how to air refuel, right. put them up there and make sure you could do it, and then give them a check ride. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but the competition, it's like anybody could be ordinary. Mm -hmm. 
you know, and, and I keep, when I talk to young people about their lives and what they want to do, I say, just imagine what you can do if you weren't afraid. Mm -hmm. And focus. And focus and be able to expand your envelope. Mm -hmm. Like going Mach 3 is cool. Going Mach 5 is way cool. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think what's really cool about that, too, is you had the hyper focus to allow you to perform at the best of your abilities and really get far, but also knew when a side opportunity presented itself to take that other path, right? Um, I think, you know, it can get easy when you're hyper-focused to kind of focus on that vision, and that's the only thing for you. It's like, I'm going the astronaut way, and that's, that's all there is. But bypass or, you know, skip over something that's really exciting that could be its own path as well. So, like, um, how do you think about that balance? Or, you know, how do you philosophically approach that? Or if you're, you know, a young... Uh, person coming up, um, you know, maybe not even as a pilot, just as someone in their career with hyper focus. When do you know the right time to maybe I should divert from from this vision that I had? I would say uh, you have to have courage. OK. I mean, you know, you can stay in your little zone and be very happy in your life. Maybe never even leave your own neighborhood. Mm -hmm. But it takes an extraordinary person to break out of that and and have the courage you know, um, being a leader, one of the characteristics you got to have is courage. You got to be able to put it on the line mm -hmm. and know that you're right. And when you go through life, it's a bunch of branches and sequel. It's never a straight line. You know, you can be here for a while, be there for a while. I mean, to go through and become a flight test engineer. I mean, you had to go through a bunch of this to get to that point. Oh, yes. Yeah. And, and you know, everything, your coursework, you had to get a job, you had to do this, you had to get experience. Uh, and then you get there and they go, OK, what do I do next? Yeah. And you just keep you got to keep moving. You don't mm -hmm. want to stop. But like you said before, foundation is so important. Mm -hmm. I mean, right from the time you're in grade school, um, STEM classes and all that kind of stuff. If you're going to move in this direction, if you don't have the foundation, then the opportunities don't present themselves. Right. If you have the foundation and the opportunity comes along. Then you're in the then, neighborhood of luck. That's something we always talk about. Yeah. It's like put yourself in the neighborhood of luck and then take right. it when you have mm -hmm. it. Right. Um, yeah, so uh, that's something also that we spend a lot of time thinking about when we're hiring people is, is the fundamentals. Because, you know, even people, like the amount of people who've worked on hypersonics or even high-speed flight, you know, the, the Mach 3s and above, um, there, there aren't very many of them. Um, and so we can't rely on direct experience. And so the only way we can do that is the strong fundamentals and bringing people on who can mm -hmm. kind of expand it. So obviously the SR is, is uh, you know, the coolest plane, but is it your favorite plane? To fly on, without a doubt. <laughs> Is there any chance that it's anything else? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say you that, flew um, almost everything. The, yeah, I, I, the test pilot flew a lot of airplanes, and a lot of them were good, and a lot of them were really bad. Uh -huh. But uh, <laughs> I would jump in, uh, you know, uh, Black Star SR seventy two tomorrow. Okay. Well, I would too. Oh yeah, just uh, well, you could be on the next Top Gun and I, yeah, I'd, I'd push it to the. <laughs> well, uh, we haven't seen too much but, about how real that is, but uh, yeah. maybe well, it's maybe it's more real than the movie. For all the airplanes we've seen up till now, that's the coolest one. Yeah, that's the coolest <laughs> one. All right. Yeah. Okay. Well, Michelle, what is your favorite? Not quite the SR seventy one, but uh, my my favorite airplane is always the airplane I'm working on. Yeah, always the air, the airplane mm, I'm testing okay. because it. I have to have so much so much system knowledge, so much right. team knowledge, so much environment knowledge mm -hmm. that that aircraft just permeates right. everything you do oh, when yeah, well, you're in the flight test program. We really got you drinking the Kool-Aid. So that's great. <laughs> that's <laughs> experience speaking. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, you know, speaking of flying Mach 5, you know, you guys say that you know, Mach 3 is great, but Mach 5 is even better. Um, so w what do you think about the Hermes story? You know, we've we've talked briefly about it. Uh, where are we doing things right? And where are we absolutely stupid and absolutely crazy? And we should not even, uh, you know, we should really think about things more directly, I guess. So I think your approach now is is right on uh, unmanned before manned. Okay. Uh, you, especially when you're going to that next uh, level. Mm -hmm. um, and if you think in commercial, which you guys are at some point down in the future, you've got to really iron out every, every uh, abnormality with all these things. Right. We got to have the shops and we got to have the yeah, data. You could put yeah. test pilots' lives at risk because we, even in the SR, we knew there was a risk, mm -hmm. and we were more than willing to accept that risk. Right. If I'm sitting back in row 42C and I'm mm -hmm. uh, drinking a gin and tonic, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
I, I didn't buy any risk at all. Right. I, I expected <laughs> right. to take off and land where I was supposed to in, you know, in an hour's time or something and be halfway around the world. Uh, yeah. Uh, your approach is, uh, is very laudable. Uh, okay. I would recommend that you keep your team small. Right. And, you know, keep your management, you know, the ones who make decisions has to be very, very limited. Uh, and you need to keep going fast. Mm -hmm. Speed is important in development and flying it. You know, go back to the SR days. You know, by the time they got on contract and flew the first operational mission, mm -hmm. which is only about three years. Right. And so, I mean, they built that airplane from A A12 designs. Yep. And they got that thing going in a couple years and delivered their airplanes to the Air Force. You know, the first... You know, just from a background standpoint, you know, the contract was for about six or seven airplanes. They finally built 32. But uh, the price per airplane was $23 million a copy. Mm -hmm. You know, in today's C <laughs> CI, uh, CPI, it's about $250 million yeah. a copy. That's still cheap for right. that airplane. Right. But the fact is, Kelly and Lockheed, they were moving fast. And, and oversight was not, they didn't want any oversight. Right. I think to your point as well about keeping people off of it during the development, especially for these early test vehicles, um, that's how we can really, really move fast and keep things the cost down because right. we can take a different approach to risk, um, you know, than than if there's a person on board or mm -hmm. even if there's not a person on board. If we're talking about a five hundred million dollar development vehicle, the risk posture has to be drastically different, and yeah. how you test it has to be right. different, and the mm -hmm. redundancy, and then it adds more cost. And so, um, you know, we were briefly talking about uh, an SR-72 like capability um, that would have that hefty price tag. Well, now you're also driving up requirements on speed. If you're going Mach 6, 7, 8, now you're into scramjet territory. You're into, you know, ceramic matrix composites for primary structure, which is still a little bit sciencey, uh, a little bit less engineering. So um, that's kind of at least you know, the way that we're approaching this is this is how you break the price um, is don't go as fast. Pull back on the speed and then apply the small company resources and agility to really move fast and get something right. in the air. Yep. So I would also uh, make uh, a statement here about testing. Mm -hmm. you know, so the question really is to the flight test engineer, why do you test at all? Mm. And I would say that it depends on where you're sitting. Mm -hmm. You test to minimize the maximum regret. I like that. <laughs> and and it, it works every time. Yeah. So if you're testing uh, the quarter horse, mm -hmm. what's your maximum regret? Mm -hmm. It doesn't take off. It crashes, you know, and you learn from it and you move on. We get embarrassed and, and yeah. then we, we yeah. go again. Mm -hmm. But but from a from a crew standpoint, maximum regret is that thing blows up when I'm flying it. That's the, my maximum regret. Right. Or, you know, or I'm flying the A&S goes out and I wind up flying over Mother Russia and they mm -hmm. shoot me down. That ain't good either. Mm -hmm. So you test to make sure that thing doesn't happen. Whatever it is, you have to decide mm -hmm. where you sit. Is, what is that maximum regret? And you test to make sure that never happens. Mm -hmm. That's great. All right. Uh, let's see. Let's talk. Uh, let's talk some stories. Uh, <laughs> <All right. laughs> cool. Um, yeah, Bob, we'll start with you. You know, what is uh, what's your most challenging SR-71 story? Uh, most challenging. Um, I'd, I'd have to say that uh, one of the first times I flew to, uh, to England, mm -hmm. I was a pretty new crew member, and we have a thing called a giant heater. We call them heater missions, where you take an airplane all the way over to uh, where you're gonna go. So mm -hmm. it was a four air refueling mission. Uh, it took off um, out of, at middle of night out of uh, Beale, California, refueled. And uh, it was nighttime, and then I, accelerated the way you do this you get your fuel you come off you accelerate uh, and you climb at uh, you know you do a dipsy about 0.9 Mach number at the bottom out and you climb out uh, and, and accelerate all the way up to Mach 3 plus as I climbed out the sun was just coming up in the east I was kind of flying I was going northeast so the sun was coming up in the east so the mm -hmm. right side had the sunrise and the left side was still stars okay and I could actually see the the shadow of the earth, which was pretty remarkable. That's incredible. Yeah. And then descended back down over Nova Scotia to get my another tank of fuel from a from a KC-10, which I've never flown behind before in the middle of the night, especially, and got the fuel there. It worked out, flew off, went down over the uh, over the ocean, Atlantic, in the northern part of the Atlantic. The thing is, 
we had to fly at max Mach number going across the ocean. Okay. Because at 3.0, you didn't have enough gas to make it. And okay. you don't want to run out of gas in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Certainly. <laughs> so you went at 3.2, and the faster you go, the better the engine performed. Right, it right. Came down, and then I had to refuel uh, before I went north to the Arctic Circle. And um, it happened to be in the thunderstorm mm -hmm. and had to refuel the SR not at 25,000 feet, but 30,000 feet. And now I'm getting into some technical detail here, but what it. happens is you run out of thrust uh -huh. while you're refueling. The airplane starts taking on fuel about 80,000 pounds. And when you get towards the end, you don't have enough thrust, ava thrust available mm -hmm. and mill power. Mm -hmm. So you have to light an afterburner to okay. stay on the boom. And that in itself is pretty exciting. Mm. <laughs> but being in a, in a thunderstorm made it even more exciting. And because I was so high, this is the first time I, I ever heard any, anybody do this. I had to light two afterburners. Okay. To get, be able to stay on the thrust curve to do that. And from there, accelerated, went up north of the uh, Arctic Circle, did a right-hand turn. So you can kind of see one around the Barents Sea, Kola Peninsula. Mm -hmm. Came back, another refueling, and then... I had to land in England, which okay. I've never done before either. Okay. So I, re <laughs> I, re I refueled behind a KC-10 at night. I refueled above a, th a thunderstorm. I went north of the Arctic Circle for the first time in my life. I turned into the SAM sites mm -hmm. and re landed back in England uh, and all my first mission to take an airplane over <laughs> to England. It was and a that's why they choose the best. That's, <laughs> it, was a very, it was a big boy program. And yeah. So um, I would say that that was probably one of what's the what's the time duration of something like that well four air refuelings uh it was about a seven and a half about six and a half hours six yeah half. that's that's six that's a, a good hour. amount of time of height heightened focus uh yeah you're probably yeah. never coming down one, one you thing, just flew halfway around the world right basically. yeah right one, one thing i did mention is uh, the preparation for that flight mm. uh you know every flight operational flight we had to have a full physical by a flight surgeon mm -hmm. uh training flight uh, just a NCL's uh, PSD person can do it, but you know. And then we had our we had our breakfast. Whatever we flew, we always had breakfast mm. with steak and eggs, high protein. Mm -hmm. uh, and the astronauts did that too, right? Huh? Is, didn't the astronauts do that too? Yeah, and they do it for a reason. Okay. You no, know, you we want to have a you know very low uh, residual mm. when you eat that stuff. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you get my drift. Yeah. And. <laughs> And so, but here's, a, here's what happened. So when you get to altitude and you got to come down and refuel, refueling is a very hard thing to do, mm -hmm. especially when you're in a thunderstorm. And so you need energy. So what I would do, I don't know what you do, is, Tommy. I should I, sleep during the refueling. You slept? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I usually do. Back is I, yeah. I, I took, uh, we, we, we had, had to do the rendezvous. And all that. You did. The, <laughs> we could, we could eat, we could eat baby food okay. and it came in a, it was tube food, mm -hmm. right? And you could feed yourself through the in a spacesuit with a big extender. And I always used to take uh, peaches okay. and diluted Gatorade. I'm getting into more detail here. But about 15 minutes before I started coming down into, into the normal atmosphere, I'd do the peaches, Gatorade, come down. And then about time I got to the boom, the, all that energy kicked in. Mm -hmm. And I was, you know, I could I hang on the boom. You know, I had my, and then when I got off the boom, I was like, Totally collapsed, right? Because <laughs> it was pretty hard. I have uh, no idea what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> Sugar rush is key to aerial refueling. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, Bob mentioned before about how hot the windows would get. Uh -huh. We could take our tube food. If They had one that was like turkey and gravy. Mm. You'd hold it up to the window for about 20 seconds, come back and have a nice warm turkey. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that was a day. I got the chance. Of, I also flew the U-2. Mm -hmm. And the U-2, eating a meal was a ritual. Okay. So you had a heater. Uh-huh. And you you take the first hour thinking about eating, <laughs> and then you take your tube food there. and you put it in your <laughs> heater, and it would take you know 15, 20 minutes to heat it. Then you take it, and you open it up, and you get your beef and gravy. You know, like Tommy said, you know, just hold it for ten seconds. There you boom, go. You were done. Yeah, plenty of heat. There's no problem with heat. It's <laughs> a good use for speed. Because you had no time. I mean, the SR was not like the other airplane you do because you never had time to be uh, to do sightseeing. Mm -hmm. You were continuously, and the windows weren't very big anyway, you were continuously focusing on monitoring systems, right. make sure that you sure you were not off the black line. And about every two or three sweeps, you take a look out the window for a second or two. And, ah, that's really cool. And then you come back <laughs> in and you yeah. go, that, that's about it from a sightseeing standpoint. Mm -hmm. So 
talking about it is probably more fun than actually sitting in than there doing, doing it. it. Yeah. So I guess, how do you see autonomy playing into that? Are you believers in autonomy or do you think there are certain things that a pilot or a human should be doing? Um, and, and how much, you know, do you start turning up the autonomy and when is the right time? Well, uh, if I could start, and sure. I, I, I'm a true believer in mm -hmm. autonomous systems. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at what we did by sending Curiosity to Mars. Mm -hmm. Incredible, like all, the amount of complexity. All by itself. Yeah. Right? As a matter of fact, we sent the software when it was about a year into the mission mm -hmm. before we even added software. You know, we have airplanes now that can fly. You know, we, we've proven with uh, uh, UAVs that we can fly those autonomously. Now, I would only give you an example uh, that machines, computers can solve very complex problems very well. They don't mm -hmm. get tired. They can crunch all the numbers. When it comes time to solve complex problems, mm -hmm. complexity is what humans do best. Mm -hmm. they, they get tired and don't like to do the, the complicated, but when it comes to complexity, mm -hmm. we can solve problems. Good example, Neil Armstrong, first Apollo landing on the moon. Mm -hmm. If he would let the, uh, the computer do it, which was only a few, it wasn't really a computer at that time, mm -hmm. it would have crashed in the wrong place. He took control because mm -hmm. he knew with his experience this was not going to be a good day if we mm -hmm. land here. And he moved it over Tranquility Bay and everything. So there's a time and place for everything. Can we get to a point where we can have passengers in the back mm -hmm. and machines in the front? We will get there. Eventually. We will get there. Right. I think in the military, air refueling tankers, we are at a point now where we could put a tanker without any people inside mm -hmm. and make it all autonomous. And as a matter of fact, the receiver can be autonomous, too. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, that's a long answer to say. The big thing in, in military, the trigger puller right. should still be a, an individual sure. person. Right. I don't think we'll that's a complex right. decision. It's, because, yeah, yeah it's, it's nuanced. It's hard. It's situational. There's, a, well, there's a lot of context. The, it goes back to the complexity thing, too. Right. Do I pull the trigger now? Am I, you know, do yeah. However, we'll, we'll launch a, uh, a cruise missile mm -hmm. and it'll fly for a thousand miles and it'll decide whether or not to hit the target at the end. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we're kind of there now, but uh, I agree with you, Tom. You know, when there's a complex decision that has to be made because of geopolitical, whatever, at that time and that moment, you may have to have someone go, no, we're, we're going we're, we're gonna to abort and go home. Just so you have someone to blame, right? Yeah, I wanted to add Accountability. Something. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to add something back on when Bob was talking about being up in the Barrens and all that. Yeah. You know, and one of the coolest things, I wanted to add to what his his flight, we had a flight up there in the wintertime where uh, you'd go through what they called a Terminator. Mm. That's a light, d light uh, darkness to light. Mm. And we went through the Terminator, and then we ended up flying through the Aurora Borealis. Oh, man. Wow. And talk about... Just cool. In yeah. the brief three seconds after you look at your instruments and then you look back up. Oh, yeah. Like, <laughs> well, I was looking up pretty yeah. much because it was like flying through a lava lamp. Oh, that's the only way awesome. I can describe yeah. it. Yeah. Wow, that's awesome. That's really so, cool. Let me give you another thing about flying up north of the Arctic Circle sure. that, that can get you in trouble, kind of like Icarus flying too close to the sun. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> normally, the temperature it gets uh, constant at about minus 56 and a half degrees centigrade when you get to about 80,000 feet. When it gets much colder than that, and you got to maintain a Mach number, you got to fly higher. Mm -hmm. And we do what's called a W over delta, mm -hmm. which is a basically cruise climb. So as we get lighter, we go higher and higher and higher. So on a sortie I flew, that was called a stimulator mission, which you can imagine what that does. Yep. Uh, it was so cold uh, that how cold was it, Bob? Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, I got to altitude, and I, and my technique was to bring the throttles all the way back to min afterburner and let let it seek out Mach 3, whatever altitude. Mm -hmm. And normally it starts at about 78,000 and makes its way up to about 82 or 3. Mm -hmm. Well, it leveled off. It was probably more like 84, 85 at Mach 3 at min afterburner. And uh, kept on getting colder. And my cruise climb kept on taking me higher and higher till I got to, can I say this? I was over 90,000 in the same yeah. situation. Well, I, was up, <laughs> I was up about 92,000 feet. Uh -huh. And I'm going, and the mission, I had to fly a high bank, high Mach. So I had to go accelerate the Mach 3.2 and mm -hmm. go to 45 degrees and turn 
into the threat and go through Not a lot of air up there. Mm -hmm. So what happened is I got so high that aerodynamically the airplane wasn't going to do. So what the only thing you have to do to be very careful is that two things. You don't exceed the, the keys, the knots equivalent airspeed, and the angle of attack. Angle of attack is like eight degrees. Mm -hmm. And if you go above eight degrees and you have an unstart, you can, you're going to, airplane's going to pitch up and you're going to be swimming home or you're going to freeze it up. So in that turn, the only thing I could do with max AB was descend. Mm -hmm. And descending and turning into a threat is never a good idea because mm -hmm. altitude and speed is life. Mm -hmm. And I finally came out and I'd lost probably 10,000 feet in that turn. Mm -hmm. But I was locked on that, uh, on the AOA gauge. So the thing will perform, but you got to be careful. I mean, the wings still have to have airflow and it still have to create lift and right. they'll be able to- That's why the keys are so important. That's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that, that one thing you need to be careful at going at Mach 5, how high are you going to fly mm -hmm. and how big are your wings going to be? Right. And, and you have to need, you know, reaction jets or something mm -hmm. like that on your wingtips to get to the turn. Right. The other thing though, too, when you talk about, we used to call it making gas. Mm -hmm. you, you look at your fuel profile, <laughs> and in a situation just like Bob described, higher you get, colder you get, well, you're way above the fuel curve. <laughs> All yeah. of a sudden you're going, wow, we could, yeah, I would, say we could almost make it back without an refueling. <laughs> when you get your fuel off a tanker, what I used to think about, it might not, might not see another tanker for 2,500 miles. Mm -hmm. And it may be over water and not over land. So our, when we're bingo fuel, sometimes we're bingo fuel to a tanker. So you had to get the gas. Mm -hmm. There was no, I, I don't feel good today, I'm going to go land somewhere because there's no way to land. Mm. So, you know, making gas and having good techniques for fuel is really important. And I never did the flight manual throttle stuff because that was, I always had my better technique. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's, that's the, the story for not having autonomy too early because you have to figure it out, right? And that's what a human can do. And then at that point, you can roll it in once you've kind of figured it out. Uh, Michelle, do you have any exciting flight test stories that you're oh. allowed to say? <laughs> maybe that, maybe not ones you're allowed to say. Be careful with control system mode transitions. Mm. That's all I have to say. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, Tom, let's talk about uh, June 29th, 1987. Okay. Um, this qu question comes up when people ask me, what was the uh, highlight of your SR-71 mm -hmm. career? And... I always say, well, it didn't happen while I was flying the airplane. It happened 30 years after I flew the airplane. And what I, what I mean by that is June 29th, 1987, we're flying a, sort of a routine reconnaissance flight up over the uh, Baltic uh, where you come up, which is now, it was all Soviet Union then. Now it's Estonia, Latvia, uh, Lithuania, up into uh, so Soviet Union. Uh, and then you start... And it's a Mach 2.8 sortie, and you're at about, again, 80,000 feet. And just as we approach our turn point, where if we don't turn, we're going right over the Soviet Union. Uh, we always flew about, inter well, we try to maintain international waters, 12 mm -hmm. miles. But sometimes we were a little bit closer, just depending on some of the targets and such. But the, the Russians claimed 100 nautical miles. Mm -hmm. So we were always in what they considered to be international airspace. So they'd file protests every time we flew, uh, which, you know, with the UN, but it, <laughs> it was on deaf ears. But so literally uh, three seconds prior to when we we're supposed to sort of turn back to the south. And I know this for a fact because the backseater, you'd always count down the last three seconds, you, you know, three, two, one start turn mm -hmm. in case something would happen in case the ANS kicked off or um, the autopilot kicked off or whatever. So we were always very careful on all our turn points and it was three, two, bam, right engine blows up. And uh, it felt like an unstart at first because the unstarts mm -hmm. can be pretty mm -hmm. severe. So an explosion, <laughs> an engine explosion, was not much different than an unstart to mm -hmm. give you an idea wow. of how <laughs> dynamic an unstart could be. Uh, real quick for the yeah. listeners who don't know what an unstart is, uh, just a, if you want to give a quick, like 15 second overview. Yeah, I mean, you can't have uh, supersonic air going through a compressor. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, uh, the air is bled around the compressors mm -hmm. to create a ramjet effect. Right. 
And if you lose that airflow, mm-hmm. spit the shock out and then spit the sho- shock's drag. gone. Oh. And then the next thing you know, you, the engine will, well, we called it unstart because we call it started <laughs> when the airflow mm-hmm. was going the way it was supposed to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you always could tell which side of the airplane unstarted because your head would bounce off the opposite side. <laughs> <laughs> we had guys crack helmets because yeah. mm. the uh, face plates. Because the unstart was so brutal. Yeah, it was pretty violent. But anyway, so that wasn't even this. Like, no, this is actual A little engine. bit more, you know, standard thing uh, for pilots, but, you know, a losing an entire engine. Right. <laughs> well, one thing nice, this was an explosion. Uh-huh. Uh, when we got on the ground, I mean, you could walk through the uh, hole in the cell. It was about six, eight feet around. Um, just to give you an example of how big this was. Mm-hmm. But anyway, uh, um, right engine explodes. Nice thing to know about the SR, because we're at 80,000 feet, not a lot of air. So you have an explosion, you have a fire, molten titanium. Titanium's melting. It's so hot. Fire goes right out. Not enough fuel to keep mm-hmm. the fire going. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, now we're in our descent. But just like any pilot realizes when you have an emergency like that, first three things you do is fly the jet, fly the jet, fly the jet. Mm-hmm. So now we're going straight. Do we go over to the Soviet Union? You know, it's like, uh, well, you know, do the math. (laughs) (laughs) They're not around anymore. Yeah. Anyway, so we continue straight. And the SR, when you lose an engine like that, you'll fall about 40,000 feet a minute. Wow. So it's like those cartoons where you're watching the altimeter just going. So anyway, um, get control of the airplane, take care of the emergency. Uh, Dwayne Noll was my friend senior. Dwayne says, uh, hey, Tom, give me a heading. I said, 180, let's get the hell out of Dodge. So we make a left turn, 180, and we start headed towards Gotland Island. Now, we don't have an ANS. All that's kicked off. Mm-hmm. There's no navigational capabilities at all. Fortunately, we had some we were VFR capable. Mm-hmm. I could see Gotland Island. And so I just gave him a heading straight over Gotland mm-hmm. Island, which is Swedish airspace. Mm-hmm. I figured Swedes were better than Russians, so <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's go with that. So now we're level, leveled off about 25,000 feet. Uh, 380 knots, and we're headed over to Gotland Island. When I look out to my left, and I see two aircraft coming, two fighter aircraft, and I'm looking out to my left, we're headed south, I'm looking towards the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, okay, this is it. We'd already decided, Dwayne and I talked about it, we're not going to give them the jet. We're not going to, they can't force us to land. If, he said, well, you keep watching those fighters. If you see anything coming off the rails, we're punching. So I'll put it in a dive and we'll punch. And uh, so as I got closer and closer, I'm watching them like a hawk. And I noticed those are not Soviet markings. They were Swedish Vigans. Hmm. The Swedes used to try to run an intercept. Uh, they practice intercepts so that if they ever had to go against uh, uh, MiG-25 or SU-31 or something, they, uh, they would practice against us because we were going Mach 3. And we would always come down the same exact quarter. It's like we're telling them exactly where we are. Mm-hmm. Oh, and maybe and and they still couldn't shoot us. They still couldn't intercept us. <laughs> but uh, but anyway, uh, so now that they they came around, they got on our wing and they escorted us out. Uh, and I didn't realize at the at the time, but when I got to the Pentagon, my next assignment after the SR was at the Pentagon on the Joint Reconnaissance Center mm-hmm. on the in the uh, National Military Command Center. And the NSA guy told me, my f- very first day I was there, he said, because I know you, and you know, I know about your mission and all this <laughs> stuff. And they didn't tell us this. We didn't have, the, we only had a secret clearance flying the SR. Can you believe that? Wow. So when I got to the Pentagon, the guy said, did you know you had over 20 fighters launch at you that day? 20? Wow. All with orders to force you to land, they wanted the aircraft, or shoot you down. Wow. So if it wasn't for those two Viggen pilots, and then when... And also the Soviets were being told, stay with them. When those vegan pilots run out of fuel, shoot them down. Get them. They sent up two more pilots on a quick, rea- on a quick reaction launch. And they had, they had um, weapons aboard. Mm. Whereas the first two, they were just on a training mission. They, didn't, they were unarmed. So they continued to, uh, f- uh, sort of, uh, to escort us out until we got over Denmark. Now, had they been had Sweden been part of NATO like they're about to be, we'd have just landed in Sweden. 
but they were a neutral nation. So we were, we were told we couldn't land there. So we headed over to, towards Denmark. Denmark socked in, can't get in there. We end up landing in West Germany at Nordholz Air Base. And uh, on top of everything else, uh, since the right engine exploded, we lost our uh, utility hydros. So we had to land without brakes or steering. Wow. The Germans shut off the Autobahn outside the base. <laughs> and we almost, we, we almost uh, had one application of brakes, almost ran into the landing lights, but just stopped at time. And that was it. Um, the reason I tell the story and 30 years comes in is that I looked for these guys. I, you know, when I got to the Pentagon, I the said, Swedish I got to find these Swedish pilots. I got to thank them. My God, they saved our life. Not only did they save our life, this was one week after uh, President Reagan stood in front of the Blandenburg gates and said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall. One week later, had we been captured, shot down, et cetera, mm -hmm. after penetrating Soviet airspace, that wall does not come down in 1989. Wow. Wow. So that's, that's the historic implications oh, of absolutely. this mission. Mm -hmm. That's what these guys did that day. Yeah. So when I, I tell the story and everybody would think, oh, we got to help you. 30 years I'm looking for these guys. I stay there working after I got out of the Air Force. I'm doing congressional affairs. I'm, I'm meeting people from the uh, Swedish embassy, um, guys that work for Saab. Uh, everybody, every guy I talked to that was a pilot uh, for the Swedish Air Force knew about the SR-71 incident. Mm -hmm. I said, well, can you help me find these four guys? <laughs> They said, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll do it. They come back. You know, I'd see them six weeks later. Oh, I couldn't find anything out. Turns out we had classified the mission for 25 years. Now it's declassified. The Swedes, because we penetrated Swedish airspace, they had classified it for 30 years. And so as soon as the 30-year marker came up, you were able to... All of to a sudden, I get a call from this guy who was squadron commander that day. Uh, and he goes, uh, I think we ought to get together. It's a, it's a Swedish uh, pilot. And we meet, he's at the uh, Air Force Association meeting uh, convention, and we get together, and he tells me, he goes, not only, are the, I go, do you know these four pilots? He goes, yeah, I was our squadron commander that day. I'm the one that launched the other two aircraft. He goes, not only do I know these guys, and they're all still living, he said, and they all can't wait to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. Especially so, so long afterwards. It's, yeah, 30. It's just like so with the help of the Air Force um, uh, air staff and the international affairs, we were able to vet the story, get it all put together. And we went over there and we presented these four pilots with the U.S. Air Force Air Medals, mm -hmm. yeah. which is almost unheard of wow. to a foreign. Uh, but just the massive uh, impact. It's, it's incredible. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. incredible. Change the world. Yeah. yeah, it was with those guys. And I, I just can't say enough about what those guys did that day. Mm -hmm. I mean, saving me, you know, that, that was great. That's pretty nice. That was pretty, <laughs> good. Yeah, pretty yeah. good. That was <laughs> pretty good to, yeah, to begin with. Well, let, but, me, let me add, Tommy. Yeah. You know, you're kind of humble, uh, but uh, th this was a quite a remarkable thing that uh, Tom and Dwayne did. Not the whole, it's a good story because he's talking about it, but they made a decision. They were not going to give this airplane up, and they mm. had committed to jump out and crash that airplane. Mm. And that just think of the courage it did to have yeah. that conversation. Mm -hmm. So into know. the freezing Baltic. Yeah. <laughs> but out here's another thing pan. I didn't know until I talked to these guys 30 years later. We just figured we'd punch out, probably die. You know, we're going <laughs> to hypothermia. Yeah. We're going to die within minutes. The Russians and the Swedes both had uh, rescue helicopters airborne, waiting for us to ditch the aircraft. They were going to. Wow. It was going to be a race to see who could get us first. Yeah. Can you believe so, that? Hot commodity. Yeah. <laughs> High-value assets. <laughs> oh, my God. So you're a real hero, Tommy. Well, they are. I mean, uh, and, you know, the, Tom and I had lunch together. We talked about the, the crew members. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you know, to, to a man, and they didn't have any women flying. They should have. But to a man, every, every person was a solid citizen. You could yeah. trust your life with that person. Mm -hmm. There was your brother. Yeah. And uh, maybe we had a couple of bad apples here and there, but on the most part, they were all just just like Tom. Just patriots. It's and, and still brotherhood. Yeah. Now, I was in a fraternity in college. I went to Carnegie Mellon. I was a SAE Sigma Alpha Epsilon. And I still keep in touch with a lot of those guys. 
But for a lot of those guys, that's the last time they had a brotherhood. Mm. The brotherhood of the SR-71 is, is 10 times mm -hmm. as, as much connected. Yeah. It's like a band of brothers. You see, the, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. that's yeah. what we were. We were a band of brothers flying these airplanes. Mm -hmm. yep. And you think about the Cold War, all my F-15, F-16 buddies, they were just drilling holes in the sky. Yeah. It was all practice missions for them. Mm -hmm. We were flying up in a real The stakes were really, really high. Oh. Yeah, we're yeah. flying combat missions. Right. Mm -hmm. And yeah. and that, that mission, more than any, shows mm -hmm. exactly what the risks were. Mm -hmm. The stakes will never be that high here, but, you know, building that culture is something that's super important to us. So, you know, when the stakes are high, I think it's a little bit more deep, probably. Uh, but it's something we really do care about is, like, building that... Uh, I'll say brotherhood, but you know the the gender the, the <laughs> gender neutral specific one. Uh, but you know just that camaraderie, that yeah. team, right? Yeah. And well, you guys are gonna take such pride in this aircraft. Oh, definitely pride. Absolutely. But like, I mean, it won't compare to what 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 you two have done. But um, the other thing too uh, is you you when you come to the program, you get, you kind of marry your backseater, or the backseater marries you. <laughs> and I really I'm not really sure how it works, but you're stuck with them. Yeah. Through that whole time, in Tom's case. He stuck with the first name. He had two front seaters, both named Dwayne. <laughs> and one, one got uh, ill and had a heart transplant sort of mm. thing. But, I mean, my back seat here, I was the best man in his wedding, introduced him to his wife, That's still great. buddies. I mean, it's a, it's a lifelong, you know, because when, you, when you're out there on the ragged edge, which, by the way, not a lot of people are. Right. But when you go right to the abyss mm -hmm. and you go in with somebody you trust, it's amazing, uh, you know, the, the, what you can accomplish and what you and the feel feeling. to that yeah. person, you know, as a kindred uh, spirit. Mm -hmm. All right. So, uh, yeah, we'll do uh, one more story and then I'll, I'll pass it off to Michelle to answer some questions from the audience. Um, but I think we need to talk briefly about Nicaragua real quick. Yeah, Nicaragua. <laughs> that was probably my, like Tom's mission, probably my most important mission or missions as the case would be. I'll, I'll do this fast. Uh, this was when we thought... Uh, the Russians were sending MiG-21s uh, into the Central America. And uh, the, we thought they were going to Cuba. And so uh, I'd flown uh, what we call a giant clipper, which you take off at nighttime. You fly around uh, the island down there, Cuba, and you do what you have to do. And when we came back, the intel guy said, well, that ship is not in Cuba. So they watched it in satellites and found out it was going around and it was coming into another country, uh, Nicaragua. And of course that made President uh, uh, Reagan incredibly uh, angry because of the Monroe Doctrine. He was trying to get reelected. Mm -hmm. He was the same sort of thing that Thomas Hawk. He was having better relations with the Soviets and mm -hmm. all that sort of stuff. So we got this mission put on and I was a backup crew, My and there was a primary crew. Uh, that was Tommy uh, Bill Burke. In his bag, he was the primary, and so it was such an important mission. We launched. We we had two SRs ready to go. Bill got on the runway, ran him up, and had an engine malfunction. He had to do, come off the runway, and basically, I was the lead now. Mm -hmm. And so my backseater, I said, Ronald, son, you know, we're going. <laughs> I mean, I knew we were going, but I didn't have all the details. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I got, you know how that is. Right? <laughs> so we got on the runway and, you know, basically, you know, Bill says, you know, good luck, Lorenzo. That was my super seeker Habu uh, nickname. <laughs> and we blasted off, uh, took gas over uh, Mountain Home, uh, went across the United States, came down into the Gulf. Um, got fuel, climbed back up. And my mission was so unique because we're never allowed to fly uh, big bank angles, large bank angles, mm -hmm. which is 45 degrees, not that much, but 45 degrees at high altitude, you don't know where you're doing. Sure. And, and the reason why is that, that eight knots, having an unstart pitch up, not only that, we were only limited to 30 degrees bank at nighttime, and they wanted me to do a 45 degree turn at night over Nicaragua. Okay. And so being a test pilot, I thought about this because I'd never done it before. And I said, I gotta, there's got to be a way to do this without hurting myself. <laughs> so preferred. What, what, I, what I thought about was, you know, if I look outside, I will get total vertigo. Mm -hmm. And it's dark in the cockpit. So what I decided, here's the cool thing. I'm going to turn every light in the cockpit completely bright as it can go. So it would be sitting like right here in a simulator. Mm -hmm. So I flew that turn like I was in a simulator. And it so was, it saturates your vision? 
it, is it, that the idea? I my vision. I didn't care about my night vision because I, mm. I just wanted to be able to see the instrument right. and make sure Got that it. I wasn't. So I did that, and you know, uh, it didn't really matter if my cameras were working, mm -hmm. even though they were. What was important is we we were sending a, a signal that we didn't think this was the right thing to do, and the sonic boom mm -hmm. went all the way down, and of course I blew out a lot of windows. <laughs> And the, I've got the newspaper clippings from that day from Managua. They talked about the hordes from America coming down oh. there to attack. Mm. And they, they truly believe that this was the beginning of a fight that they were going to go. The Sandinistas were going to go out and fight. Turn around, came back. I took off at three o'clock in the morning, landed uh, after another air refueling at about eight, eight thirty nine 9 o'clock. So it was a pretty fast mission. But but and I could watch the news and I could see the news of all this happening that I just did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and so normally you have about five days between missions because, you know, your blood is all messed up. Your cockpit has 26,000 feet. So there's all kinds of stuff going on. So they want you to have enough time for your body to recover. Mm -hmm. Two days later, we were up there doing it again mm. because, you know, they wanted to make sure. So we, we got a picture of the crates, got it to President Reagan. He made his phone calls. And in the end... It uh, the crates never left the boats. The boats left and never dropped the crates off. Mm. So I call this story, you know, Habu diplomacy. Habu foreign diplomacy. It wasn't, we were just sending them, waving the flag down yep. there with that airplane and said, you better not take we're here. this airplane. We're, we're, watching. we're watching we're you. Yep. And uh, I was to do it the third time, but uh, they took the crates and went home. But that was probably... I would say a series of the most important missions I did in that mm -hmm. very short uh, two week period of time. I can't imagine many of them were not important, but that's awesome. <laughs> everyone's, <laughs> everyone's got a story. Yeah. 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 That's All awesome. right, cool. Let's uh, grab these questions here. Ooh. Out of the Hermia Sarnat. All right. Are there any blackbirds still flying around in secret? No. Oh, yeah, we already covered that <laughs> we, one a little we all, bit. We yeah. all wish. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right. There's a lot of museums you can go see. I, I know. O I only know. in my Beautiful. dreams. Yeah. <laughs> quarter horse soon. Yes, quarter soon horse soon. Absolutely. Uh, what was the journey like to become an SR-71 pilot? We talked about that one yeah, as well. Yeah. Um, uh, my journey was, uh, you know, I wanted to be an astronaut, pilot training, uh, flew airplanes for a while, very young, went to test pilot school. Uh, became, I was advanced man vehicles, which is a space shuttle office down there at Edwards. And, uh, uh, went down to the astronaut physical. And then I said to my boss, I said, I'm going to go be an SR 71 pilot. And he goes, yeah, when pigs fly, mm. <laughs> but it, it happened. I went out there, interviewed, went through the five flight of Val and boom, there it was. Mm -hmm. And that was only like, I told you about the speed boats and racing. Mm -hmm. That was only a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. You know, I was 16. And when I got the start flying the SI, I was probably less than 15 years later, maybe 20. Wow. Rapid timelines. We like them here. Yeah. Accelerate. <laughs> awesome. How about uh, the process to become a backseater? Well, Beale Air Force Base yeah, was my second assignment. The program? I always wondered that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I was in the, the KC-135 Cube models, and I made it known to a number of people that if there's ever an opportunity for somebody from the tank squadrons to move over to the SR, you know, I'd be first to raise my hand. Well, it just so happened at that time, the 100th Air Refueling Squadron, or wing, combined with the 9th, um, reconnaissance wing to form one wing under the 9th SR strategic reconnaissance wing and so I was almost like a player to be named later so to consummate the marriage of the two wings they put me in the plane mm. it was perfect it was, a, well, it was awesome. a great a great move and and I mean it's one more thing about Tommy here is the case the Q model KC-135 were special tankers that refueled the SR because they could carry the JP-7. Mm -hmm. A normal tanker couldn't do that. Mm. And the, the the navigators on that airplane, the time was one of them, were, were they could perform miracles. I mean, I'd come down from 200 miles, like a screaming eagle out of space, and I'd pull up at 25,000 feet, look up, and boom, there's a boom right in front of me. <laughs> and they and they had they could they had this just the timing the timing all timing yeah. incredible it was pretty neat time yeah. 
Awesome. Oh, here's a good question. What was the most annoying thing about flying an SR-71? Yeah, I guess everyone always asks about like all the great things. Like, yeah, oh, yeah. flying fast. Well, it's yeah. like, what, what, well, <laughs> what, well, what could you do better? <laughs> yeah, let, <laughs> me, terrible. let me address that because um, <laughs> I had a guy come up to me at an air show. We didn't get to do a lot of air shows because the SR, you couldn't just go, it was a lot of, to go and fly it during the air show. We had a, usually you'd have an arrival show. Mm -hmm. You'd come in the day before the air show and then you'd stick around to the day after the air show and, and uh, the departure show. But so I'm at an air show and a guy walks up to me and goes, what's the worst thing about flying the SR-71? I go, wow, that's tough. That's a tough question because it's such a great, I mean, I, everything's so good. You know the toughest thing? Someday they're not going to let me do it. Mm. Yeah. Oh. I mean, I knew right then. Someday they're not going to let me do it, and that's going to be the worst thing. That's kind of a cop out, though, because it is still a compliment to the plane. <laughs> yeah. It's a little bit of a cop out. Like we wanted the hot heat. We wanted <laughs> 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 Under, underhanded compliment. <laughs> there, there, there's a couple. There's a couple things that irritated me. One I don't want to talk about. But <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's that good, huh? Oh, we'll save that and for other, not on the podcast. The other one I'll talk about is the faceplate on our mm. spacesuit mm. had had uh, gold wires through it that could heat the faceplate mm. because, you know, your respirations would uh, fog it over and that wouldn't be good. So you had a little knob over here that you could turn the faceplate heat up. Mm -hmm. And the annoying thing was, uh, if you got it too hot, your, the, your eyeballs would dry out. I mean, it would be so hot. Uh -huh. And if you had it too cold, you'd just fog over. So it was that, and each airplane was a little different. So that was annoying to me. Mm. Doesn't sound too annoying. Just finding the tuning. So those, those human machine interface. What's that? H the human machine interface. Human machine interface, right? Human it's, factors. Yep, that's a, that's right. And but you had to, you had to be able to see out the faceplate. Yeah, I have that's that, important. I have that really. It's a really hard struggle, you know, when you go to an Airbnb and you don't know where to put the faucet on the shower, you know, for the right heat. You know, it's just <laughs> it's a struggle I find. A, you know, it's, it's the a, same it's a burden. Thing. It's a burden I, I I you know I confront with fervor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're, we're flying, most, uh, our training stories are out of Beale Air Force Base, and in the summer, it can get pretty hot in Sacramento, just north of Sacramento. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. So, I mean, 100 degrees, 120 on the, on the flight line. And so you'd be out there, and by the time you took off, even though you had air conditioning, all that stuff with the pressure suit, sometimes the sweat would just start pouring down your face, mm -hmm. and you weren't supposed to open the face plate up. But... Because you knew Murphy's Law. If you open the faceplate up, that's when everything's going to go. You're going <laughs> to have a lights. rapid decompression. <laughs> yeah. You're going to find a spot on the side of the aircraft that's going to be you. But I can remember one time, it just got too much for me. And what you try to you try to use the tube food, the tube, and try to scratch, <laughs> scratch it. Scratch your nose. <laughs> <laughs> that you was annoying, by the yeah, way. You, could, you couldn't get it, you know. And so finally, just open up and go, close it back up. <laughs> So no pressure suits and no space suit, right. space helmets and halcyon. You got to be able to yeah. touch your face. Yeah, certainly. yeah, exactly. And not eat out of a tube. Right. All right. So, well, we, we talked about the feeling of the start and engine failure right, feels skip on. pretty the same. What else have we got? Everyone wants the same stuff. I know. About okay. Uh, what were the most memorable, important, or challenging moments? Oh, wait. We covered that, too. We covered All that. Right. Oh, yeah. Okay. Wow. We are <laughs> comprehensive. I love this. Okay. Best airplane you ever flew in? Got that one too. <laughs> <laughs> Was the flight suit comfortable? Oh, I love the flight suit. I mean, the, the cool part about it is you could you could inflate it manually. That little knob right here. And so you're sitting there for a long time flying these missions. Sometimes it gets a, you know, a little sore. You could inflate that and your whole body would just kind of lift on an air cushion. Just like an air mattress. Yeah, well, the other thing too, the helmet weighed about 40 pounds. And... You know, after a while, with it sitting on your shoulders, um, that bar got to be pretty heavy. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. But you could, like Bob was saying, you just inflate it, and that bar, your helmet would just come up a little bit. Yeah. Take that pressure off you. So. Yeah. And the other thing, and the I palms of your hand, you know, you're, when you're going to go refuel and you, your hand gets sweaty and stuff like that, there were little air vents that came out of the suit over your palm mm -hmm. to keep your, your palms dry. That was, that's I'm, pretty good. That's pretty, it's it's really comfortable, and you can adjust the temperature, mm -hmm. pressure, and uh, they took us out to the airplane. In a, it was in a, a bread truck. It was a refurbished to, with two lazy boy loungers <laughs> to take you out to the airplane because they didn't want to walk from the uh, 
lockers out to the airplane and pressure suit and carrying um, air conditioning and all that. Yeah, that little air conditioning plug in. So mm -hmm. you go into the sit down on the lazy boy. And I'll tell you, if we had any delay or anything, I'd go right to sleep. <laughs> that pressure suit was so comfortable and you can't hear anything. And you just hear that shh, the air conditioner around you. You can, you can hear yourself breathe. So if you have any tendency to be claustrophobic, mm. it would be intensified in a suit. We had, mm -hmm. uh, we had uh, crew, crew members that after their first tour, they came back and they said, I can't get back in that suit. Interesting. We had guys that come through the interview process. That was one part of the interview process was putting on the suit. Mm -hmm. And there were guys that when they got the suit on, they go, oh, that's it. Yeah, they, they go, they couldn't handle claustrophobia. Hmm. But I loved it. Yeah. I loved it so much when I came back and put my mask on to go out and fly a 38. I go, what's this thing on my face? I don't like this. <laughs> <laughs> do you know the oxygen saying, mask. Do you yeah. know yeah. Top Gun, they never wear their mask, never wear their gloves. Yeah, yeah. too cool. <laughs> <laughs> too, this, uh, you can't look cool. But not even the gloves. I mean, <laughs> God. <laughs> that's because when they... When you're flying a boat, you don't wear gloves. Oh, there you go. Mm. <laughs> Navy versus Air Force? Uh, no, he means the real boats. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> no, no. I mean, uh, aircraft carriers. Oh, you don't wear gloves? When you're aircraft No, you don't. Because they're too slippery. Yeah. You have to talk to a Navy guy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What was the most Gs you pulled in an SR-71? The aircraft was only actually... Um, Three. I thought it was like two and a half. Well, three G's, uh, two and a half at 45 degree, but you can pull in a, in a three G's. But unfortunately, when you pull three G's, it's got, you're so close to the stall that you mm -hmm. have a stick shaker and then a stick pusher. So mm -hmm. it starts shaking and then- And you, and you would never do that at altitude, mm -hmm. of course, at right. speed. Right. That would only be in the pattern or anything. We had a we had a um, Thunderbird pilot came, after he flew Thunderbirds, came and flew the SR and then- the, Air show at Milton Hall. You, I was a, the, I was a DO. You were the DO then. He over G the aircraft, bent the aircraft. <laughs> you know, you think about it, the SR seventy one is what seventy feet long. It's seventy, uh, yeah. Yeah, seventy, 70 and hundred. No, it's one hundred and seventy feet long. One hundred seventy. Okay. And you think about it, all that space from the back seat all the way to the back of the engines, that's all fuel in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And. And so you, you pull a couple G's, you, that, that's a lot of stress on that aircraft. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, but if, if you, and uh, I don't know this one, but when you pull G's like that and you try to light the afterburner, uh, the fuel doesn't go in the right place and you wind up with kind of explosions in the back of the a uh, hard airplane. Start. Yeah. yeah. And well, I got a picture of that that's thing. Dougie and the yeah. mic. And oh, just because asymmetric fuel in the in the AB or and just during the AB, yeah. pull, if you pull over three G's, and when the fuel comes out, it doesn't. It's not you know you have that triethyl boron thing going on. Okay, mm -hmm. and what happens fuel. is it just you get these big explosions out the back, and actually there's we have pictures of them doing that. Hmm. And I was in the tower when we did that. A little Fourth of July celebration there. It was not pretty. <laughs> it was pretty, but it wasn't good for the <laughs> not, not, not for the right time. reasons. Yeah, <laughs> it makes for good posters. I still see that airplane. I know. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, that's it for our uh, fan questions. Awesome. Tom, Bob, this has been great. Uh, I think, you know, the, the people listening will really appreciate it. Thank you for your service. Thank you for uh, flying that fast airplane and, and doing those really high stakes, really important missions for the country. And, uh, you know, I'm... Uh, well, we'll be watching you guys. I mean, what you guys are doing is incredible. I wish you the, all the best. And I hope you're out there real soon, Mach 5, Mach 6, and above. Oh, yeah. That's where we're headed. Awesome. All four. Thank you.